Assalamu alaikum and welcome once again to Today in African History with Baba Shaka. I'm Baba Shaka and today is January 30th, 2021. It was on this day, January 30th, in 1865, that the United States Congress enacted the 13th Amendment, which supposedly gave freedom to the enslaved Africans in this country, but with a big loophole. Does an exception clause in the 13th Amendment still permit slavery? The amendment, which officially abolished slavery in the United States in 1865, includes a loophole regarding involuntary servitude. The year the Civil War ended, the U.S. amended the Constitution to prohibit slavery and involuntary servitude, but it purposely left in one big loophole for people convicted of crimes. The 13th Amendment ratified in 1865 says, I quote, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, unquote. Scholars, activists, and prisoners have linked that exception clause to the rise of a prison system that incarcerates black people at more than five times the rate of white people and profits off of their unpaid or underpaid labor. Andrew Armstrong, a law professor at Loyola University in New Orleans says, quote, what we see after the passage of the 13th Amendment is a couple of different things converging. First, the 13th Amendment text allows for involuntary servitude when convicted of a crime. At the same time, black codes in the South created new types of offenses, especially attitudinal offenses, like, for instance, not showing proper respect, whatever that means. After the Civil War, new offenses like malicious mischief were vague and could be a felony or a misdemeanor depending on the supposed severity of behavior. These laws sent more black people to prison than ever before, and by the late 19th century, the country experienced its first prison boom. This is according to legal scholar Michelle Alexander, who writes in her book, the new Jim Crow. After a brief period of progress during Reconstruction, African Americans found themselves once again virtually defenseless. Alexander writes, the criminal justice system was, strategic, was strategically employed to force African Americans back into a system of extreme repression and control, a tactic that would continue to prove successful for generations to come. Unquote. States put prisoners to work through a practice called convict leasing, where white planters and industrialists leased prisoners to work for them. States and private businesses made money doing this, but the prisoners didn't. This meant many black prisoners found themselves living and working on plantations against their will and for no pay decades after the Civil War. Was this slavery by another name? Armstrong argues that the 13th Amendment makes an exception for involuntary servitude, not slavery, and that there are important historical and legal distinctions between the two. However, she says no court has formally dealt with this distinction, and many courts have used the two terms interchangeably. In 1871, the Virginia Supreme Court ruled that a convicted person was a, quote, a slave of the state, unquote. Like chattel slavery before it, convict leasing was brutal and inhumane. Across the country, tens of thousands of people, overwhelmingly black, were leased by the state to plantation owners, private, privately owned railroads, coal mines, and road building chain gangs, and made to work under the whip from dusk till dawn, often as punishment for petty crimes such as vagrancy or theft. This was reported in the Washington Post. Many prisoners died in these conditions. In July 2018, researcher Reginald Moore announced that he found the remains of nine to five black prisoners who died working in Sugarland, Texas in the early 20th century. Experts estimate their ages range from 14 to 70, meaning that some would have been born into pre-war, pre-Civil War slavery, freed, incarcerated, and then forced into unpaid labor once again. More than 3,500 prisoners died in Texas between 1866 and 1912, the year Texas outlawed convict leasing 
because the death toll was so high. States also benefited and profited off of prison labor by forcing chain gangs to build roads and creating prison farms to grow crops like sugar and snap peas. Today, states and private companies still rely on prisoners performing free or extremely low paid labor for them. For example, California saves up to $100 million a year, according to state corrections spokesman Bill Sessa, by recruiting incarcerated people as volunteer firefighters. States would not be able to incarcerate as many people as they do without this, in effect, subsidy of the cost, according to Armstrong. So, it masks the true nature or the true cost of incarceration. Decades of prison and civil rights activism have sought to improve conditions and pay for incarcerated workers. In 1971, inmates at New York's Attica Correctional Facilities took control of the prison and issued a list of demands, including the right to join labor unions and earn minimum wage. More recently, in the summer of 2018, Prisoner laborers across the United States went on strike to protest what they call modern-day slavery. Just this week, President Joe Biden ordered the termination of federal contracts to private prisons. Could this be the first step to ridden the 13th Amendment of this dastardly clause? Inshallah, we will see. To get a real in-depth look at this phenomenon, I highly recommend that you get a copy of Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and Take a look at the Netflix documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay. On this day, January 3rd, 1865, the United States sought to outlaw slavery, but with a big fat loophole. This has been Baba Shaka with today in African history. Until tomorrow, inshallah. Masalam.